So I didn't make it. But I was confident that I was going to make it, and that's what matters. <laughs> There's an almost certainly false story about a philosophy exam at Oxford on which there was the question, what is confidence? To which the highest scoring answer was, this is. Full stop, end of answer, walked out of the exam. <laughs> confidence is a very curious thing that very often doesn't match up well with reality. So according to Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel laureate in exactly this kind of thing, confidence is a lot more to do with the coherence of the story that you can create for yourself in your mind, and it's not really got very much to do with actual facts and figures. And this is what my talk is about. When is confidence actually reasonable? So broadly speaking, there are two kinds of confidence. There is the kind which is sort of well rehearsed, researched, and seems more reasonable, like walking. Walking is something that most of us have practiced quite a lot, uh, as have those walking trees in the Amazon rainforest that sort of wander across the ground in search of better light and better nutrients. They're really cool. They have like these roots that grow out the side of their trunks and they embed themselves in the soil so that they can claw themselves across the ground. It's pretty slow, but they're cool. Um, the other kind of confidence is more based on willful blindness. It's more based on this seemingly coherent story that you can create for yourself in your mind. And this is the kind of confidence that is most interesting to me because it's so commonplace in all of our lives and yet there's almost always overwhelming evidence that it's completely ridiculous. I mean, I was never going to be able to hold my breath for 25 minutes, but I deluded myself out there that I could do it and I absolutely went for it. And obviously, I, I failed. Um, and this kind of confidence you could very easily describe as insanity without proper, proper research. Um, a good example of this, uh, what, what I, what I want to say is that this kind of confidence can often help you to succeed. You're often more likely to succeed if you feel confident about something, even if it's crazy. So a good example of this is in 1942, Anthony Fasson, Colin Grazier, Tommy Brown, swimming across the Mediterranean Sea towards a sinking German U-boat. And all of the German crew are scrambling to get overboard and get away as fast as they possibly can. But these three guys managed to get on board, steal an Enigma machine, and loads of Enigma code books, and amazingly, one of them, Tommy, managed to get off the U-boat alive with all of this stuff and get it back to the Allies. And this was one of the single most important turning points in the war that we won 72 years ago. It's pretty amazing that people can do this kind of thing. And without confidence, how would, how would people even begin to try? I mean, I wish that I could be more confident. And I guess it's human nature for confidence to go up and down. And very often I feel quite unconfident. I mean, I know that I'm on stage in front of you all in a bath, <laughs> naked from the waist down. <laughs> you probably think I'm pretty confident. <laughs> but... Um, but look, looks, can, looks can be deceiving, I guess. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a science presenter. I like science. I like baths. And so I have this online series called Science in the Bath. <laughs> and sometimes I go out there and I interview animals to find out their opinion on science, ask them the hard-hitting questions that a lot of people are too afraid to ask, maybe. Um, and sometimes I do these sort of short facts in the shower. Um, and I try to talk about things that I think are pretty cool, like, for example, if the sun were made of ants, then it would be just as hot. But ants are pretty cool, so it would be a bit unfair to turn them into a sun. Um, for example, like, there's this species of ant called leafcutter ants that have these nests that are three meters deep, so it's a real problem to get the oxygen circulating. So they have these huge vertical tubes that go from the top to the bottom, sucking down cold oxygen, and then they sort of dump their waste in these curvy tubes up the side, and as that rots and decays, it heats up, driving out the carbon dioxide from the bottom. Really cool, like a lung. Um, yeah, so uh, through my science series, I get asked a lot of questions about things. Um, and, but one of the questions that I get the most is the existential question. Why are we here? What's the point in all of this? And for me, this represents the biggest example of unreasonable confidence that there is. 
just the fact that day to day we go through our lives reasonably confident that what we're doing is important and relevant, even though out there there's overwhelming evidence that we're not. I mean, we often think that we're the most evolved species on the planet, but check out tardigrades. These little water bears can survive at minus 272 degrees Celsius. They can survive at 149 degrees Celsius. They can survive the vacuum of outer space, 10 times the pressure of the deepest ocean trench, and they can go without food or water for 30 years in a row. We're, we're rubbish compared to them. They're, and then I've also recently found out about this really cool mold that's growing all over the Chernobyl reactor core. So it actually eats radiation. It doesn't need normal food. I mean, I say, I say normal food, but like the glucose that we eat on a universal scale is so rare, it's basically a myth. Whereas radiation is everywhere. The, this mold and those tardigrades are definitely going to outlive us. And out there in the universe, there's even more evidence that we are completely insignificant. So in 2004, loads of scientists got together and they convinced NASA to let them use a huge amount of time on the Hubble Space Telescope. And what they used this time for was repeatedly taking a photograph of a tiny, tiny region of the night sky, about a 13 millionth of the whole sphere around us, which is a tiny little speck. And the reason they chose it was because it seemed to be completely empty. No photograph of that area, that area of the night sky had ever shown up anything there before. And they repeatedly took this long exposure photograph, and eventually they got an image that is now called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And it looks like this. Every single one of those spots is a galaxy containing billions of stars. Even if you could travel at the speed of light, the fastest that anything could possibly go, it would still take you 13 billion years to get there. And when you got there, it would be completely different. And 13 billion years is a really long time. I mean, life on Earth has only been around for 4 billion years. And we've got less than a billion years to go before the oceans evaporate. Like, we're already 80% of the way through our time limit, and it's nothing compared to this. What I'm trying to say is that despite this day-to-day -day confidence that we have in our own importance, we are clearly not important. <laughs> and we can learn a lot about ourselves from this because it's amazing that we can suspend this belief that we are important, even though most of us sort of know that we aren't. <laughs> um, I mean, here on Earth, uh, there's even more evidence if, if you look at our own instability. 2.4 billion years ago, cheeky evolutionary upstart called cyanobacteria started evolving in the oceans. It was the first majorly successful photosynthetic life form. So it was pumping out loads and loads of oxygen. And at the time, oxygen was poisonous to almost everything alive. So almost everything died. It's called the oxygen catastrophe and it's one of the biggest extinction events in history. We humans would almost certainly not survive even a fraction of the environmental change that this caused. It's almost as if we shouldn't be meddling with our atmosphere in the way that we are. <laughs> Temperature is another thing that you can think about. I mean, just, just to consider how unstable we are. This is the temperature on two of our nearest neighbors, on the moon and on Venus. And this is the tiny slither of temperature that we can actually survive within. We are balanced on a knife edge. Have you ever heard the phrase, we see the world once in childhood and the rest is just memory? It's by Louise Gluck. And what it's about is this idea that, as children, everything around us is amazing. Everything that we see is a new experience and something new to understand. And so every single day, we lay down loads and loads of memories. It's completely exhausting, and as a consequence, time seems to go quite slowly. As adults, we experience the world completely differently. So, for example, we see a light switch, but we don't actually properly see the light switch. We've seen so many before, and so instead, our brain just fills in the memory of a light switch. 
Similarly, we probably all have fire alarms in our homes, but how many of us could actually draw those fire alarms from memory? We've seen them every single day, but we don't properly consider them anymore. And the older we get, the more this effect continues to crescendo. How could we be important? How could our existence be important if we can't even be bothered to pay proper attention to it? I've tried to use the biggest example that I could to demonstrate the point that it is human nature to be unreasonably confident about things. Clearly, our lives aren't that important, and yet we create this story for ourselves that they are. I mean, confidence can be a great thing, though. It helped to build Elon Musk's empire, which is now revolutionizing transport and energy storage. It helped these forklift truck drivers to reach higher than ever before. It helped us to eradicate smallpox. It helped us to set up the internet. It helped us to do all kinds of things, like set up actual artificial suns that are now being created in Oxford and now being built in the south of France. The hottest place in the galaxy right now is just outside Oxford where we are so close to generating fusion power. But confidence can also be a terrible thing. For example, we know that there have been dictators throughout history whose confidence has driven them to plunge vast areas of the world into chaos. And similarly, even great scientists aren't immune to misplaced confidence. Einstein, oh, not Einstein, sorry, he was great. Newton's corpuscular theory of light held back the field of optics for decades, and it was his confidence in that theory. Similarly, my confidence in front of you has convinced you that every scientific fact that I've said tonight is true. <laughs> but all of them were false. <laughs> they actually weren't false, they're all, they're all true. You can check them out later. Um, what's really important is that we find people who are more confident than they should be and we intelligently and modestly erode their confidence. <laughs> it's important. And we need to find people in the world who are doing great things, who struggle to maintain the confidence that they need to keep doing them, and we need to support those people. Because confidence very rarely matches up with where it's deserved, and it very rarely makes sense. We, as humans, have such a long way to go. Humans are rubbish. I mean, think about how based on tissue paper our civilization still is. And if we're going to advance towards a brighter future, then we need to make sure the right people are confident and not the wrong people. Thanks for listening. Spread the knowledge.